would make an impressive traction slide. Traction slides that I've been impressed with, you know, these guys are growing like 50% a month. It just looks like this. That's what's most impressive. And if you build a business that can do that, then you don't have to worry about fundraising. That's the main sales pitch. How's it going? I'm Justin, Justin Khan from Justin.tv. <laughs> What's up guys, it's Justin, and we're driving around LA and I thought I'd make this video. So today we're gonna drop a little knowledge bomb on five things that we look for in a startup pitch as a VC. And so when you think about crafting your pitch, uh, here's some stuff that you could put in it. Before we get started, I wanna give you a little feedback on what the state of mind I'm in before, when I'm even looking at decks, right? So I'm getting sent decks all the time from friends, from other investors, uh, from other entrepreneurs that we've backed and I'll look through it and I'm probably spending a couple minutes maybe tops but I'm really just skimming through and I'm trying to really quickly identify am I even interested in learning more about this company the idea of a deck is not to get me to invest it's to get a meeting right with me uh, so that I can make a decision oh I'm very interested in these guys and so that's the mindset I'm in is like very simple it's like not I'm not in I'm like pretty busy you know, I'm probably distracted. I may be looking at Twitter, you know, I'm gonna be checking my email, but I'm, I'm reading through this deck and I get a lot of them. So you're going to wanna figure out ways to communicate in very simple language, uh, all the things I'm telling you. I tell you all the tips I tell you to, to communicate. Second thing, does it matter who sends me the deck, you know, as, a, as an investor? Uh, and the answer is I actually don't think it matters that much. People have always said, yeah, you want an entrepreneur that I funded to send to me instead of an investor because the entrepreneur is going to be more, you know, not incentivized whereas an investor is incentivized. I actually find that I look with, at all decks with the same healthy dose of skepticism, you know. So personally, I don't think it makes a big difference um, who sends me the deck. I don't think getting like that's one specific intro is the most important. Number one is you want to have a good framing of the problem. So you have to assume as a startup founder that the investors you're pitching know next to nothing about the industry of the problem. Uh, even if they have a background, you know, that you came from that industry, they're not actually gonna have the up-to-date context for like what are all the problems people face. Uh, so you need to educate them in layman's terms of like, what is the problem? For example, I like to often go through, like here is the day in the life of the user. For example, if, if I was doing it for Uber, I would say pitch deck for Uber. It's like in San Francisco, there's no taxi cabs. The problem is like nobody can get a taxi ever. Uh, you stand on the street corner, you want to leave to get to a party. You go outside your house, you put your arm out and you just wait there for like potentially forever. And uh, eventually a cab drives by randomly. You flag it down. Oh, it's full. No, you got to keep waiting. Then another cab drives by and you flag it down. Okay, this one's empty. You get in. And then you're like, hey, go to this location. And that guy maybe doesn't know where it is. It's very confusing for them. So you have to explain how to get there. Now you drive there, you get there, and you're like, okay, how do I pay for this? Well, oh, you need cash. They're like, oh, do you take credit cards? They're like, no, the credit card machine is taped over or whatever. So you can't pay with credit card. Now you dig through your, your wallet, you find some cash, you get your friends, you know, they get some cash, you give it to them, and then you have to tip them, and it's awkward, you don't know how much. That's the life of a pre-Uber rider. You know, and everybody takes rides. Now, picture Uber. You press a button, car shows up, you get in it, you get to your destination, you get out. That's it, that's an amazing solution. So understanding the problem, framing the problem is super important. It helps the investor empathize with the user, the experience the user is going through. Tip number two, uh, really matters who the founders are. So, you know, when you're investing, you're investing in people, finding ways to present yourselves as the experts who can solve this problem and have really strong resumes that sets you up to be somebody who really can solve this problem or a team that can really solve this problem is super important. I think uh, team is kind of like one of the slides that makes me interested in setting up a meeting and finding out more. If you're building a creator focused company, it's like, how are you guys experts and creators? Maybe you are creators. If you're building a company that requires deep AI, then maybe it's like, here's how I spent seven years working on AI research at Google. You know, whatever that relevant expertise that makes you the number one 
uh, person in the world to build this company, that's what you want to present. Bad team slides. Uh, sometimes there's just like someone's face and it's their name. And then it says like, they put like Google under it or just like a bunch of logos of like randomly affiliated things that have to do with them. Or it's people that, you know, you're listing things that like have no brand recognition. Instead be like, here are specific bullet points for why this is, you know, you have relevant experience. So like back to that creator focused startup, you know, maybe you're saying, Hey, I'm the number one, you know, I'm building something for creators and I'm the number one finance creator on TikTok or something, or I've, you know, built a podcast in this category to number five, top five or whatever, you know, it's like you have relevant experience or I worked at Twitch in partner relations and built a team that, you know, handles thousands of partners, you know, like whatever it is. What was your relevant experience when you pitched Justin TV? I, that was, that was, I mean, that, learn from what I say, not what I do. <laughs> I had no relevant experience. I, we were terrible. Tip number three, that's your solution. What is it? Right. So too often, uh, people are trying to like make it, make me do work to understand what the solution is. I'm not going to do that work to be honest. And so what I mean by that is like a lot of times people just screenshot a bunch of their UI without any context. I don't really know why that is important, right? Like why does this UI, why is it better than the existing thing? I probably am not a u user of the existing solution. So how am I going to know if this new solution, this new UI that you created for the new solution is actually good. So instead of screenshotting your UI and putting in your pitch deck, instead think about like walking people through the user journeys, like value propositions, just list of bullet points of here's the value proposition of our app and make it very, very simple. Like a lot of times people have so many value propositions, they have this wall of text. It's very confusing and I don't want to read a wall of text. So it's just like, if you can't sum up your killer app in, you know, one to three bullet points, then it probably doesn't have a killer feature that's actually driving things. So I think simplicity is your friend here. The other way you can do it is with a user story. Like, you know, think about that Uber app, right? If I when, when I'm describing use Uber versus the old, you know, hail a taxi cab on the corner with Uber, it's like press a button, ride shows up and drives you, you get out of car at your destination. That's it. It's very simple. Anyone can understand that. Should they do the user flow in like deck form or do you like videos or like a loom? You might think, oh, I'm going to record a loom and get the investor to see, you know, this loom video about how it works. And I think that can be good. Um, it's better than like them trying to play around in your site and like not understanding it. So I think definitely having a loom could uh, work, but your deck should stand alone without ever having to see the loom because I'm, you know, odds are I'm not going to look at it unless I'm interested. I get through over that one hurdle, that hurdle and say, okay, I'm interested in finding out more. So I'm going to look at this loom video. So you have to assume that your deck stands alone. I don't think video is the way to go. Number four is traction. Traction is something that always gets people interested. They're at least curious because traction, it's kind of like, oh, okay, I guess like there's some people that actually want to use this and that starts to get you thinking, well, there's there something I'm not getting about this, right? Like I want to understand what the user behavior is. So you're always going to want to put in your traction into the pitch. Now, a note about that, don't make it so that and when I understand how your traction graph works, I think you are trying to lie to me. One example is like cumulative graphs, right? Cumulative new users instead of like a users over time, right? Like if it's monthly active users and it, you know, kind of goes up like this, that's great. If it's cumulative users, it monotonically increases. And I think this guy's trying to pull a fast one over me and it seems dishonest. And so that's a big turnoff. And I'm like, kind of like, oh, I'm deleting this pitch because I'm caveating everything that you're saying in the pitch after I discover that. Does that make sense? What are some key metrics that you like to see in a traction slide? Yeah, key metrics in a traction slide. Well, obviously revenue, we love, love to see it, or profit even better than that. But we don't see many companies with any profit, let's be honest. And so if you can't do revenue, then it's user, you know, some form of user metrics, right? Like uh, hopefully daily active users or weekly active users, monthly active users, you know, the, the tighter the metric, the better, like, eventually, you know, if you put just like, sometimes I see people say user actions, you know, and user actions are like, it's like increasing a lot, right? But you don't, as a user, I don't really know what's the driver of those user actions. Well, how are they defining user actions? Is it like real or is this kind of gameable by the company? So 
the ideal metrics are the ones that are least gameable as possible and require as little explanation to the investors or really to anyone as uh, possible. What should I leave off the traction slide? So I think uh, on the traction slide, sometimes you know you have a dip because it was the holidays or something and having a little explainer, you know, something that says, oh, this is holiday season, so advertisement, or this is like Q1, so advertisement revenue is down or something like that. That's very understandable to someone who has industry context. Putting that in is is okay. Um, I think oftentimes people want to mask their non, you know, increasing growth by using fancy like weird displays of metrics on their slides. For example, I saw one that was like year one and year two were overlaid, but we were only like halfway through year two. So it was like, you know, very, very confusing. And it took me a long time to parse it. And so I, I would just, it's better to have like explainers versus, you know, very confusing graphics. Like don't make the graphics confusing because people aren't going to do work to figure things out. What would make an impressive traction slide? what would make an impressive traction slide so i mean traction slides that i've been impressed with you know these guys are growing like 50 percent a month it just looks like this i mean that's what's most impressive yeah i mean if you build a business that can do that then you don't have to worry about fundraising that is like that's the main sales pitch you know how about like customer acquisition costs or ltv or arr yeah i think you, you want to put the relevant metrics in and support your good business. So sometimes that looks like uh, things like LTV and ARR and uh, customer acquisition costs. And, uh, but you know you should only put them in if they're good. Uh, so a lot, you know I've seen companies put in LTV slides or like customer acquisition cost slides where I'm like this business does not make sense as it is. You know it doesn't like they're never gonna you know their customer acquisition cost is much higher than their LTV or they're putting in numbers that show directionally it's it's higher even though you know I can derive like I can I can look at like what the conversions rates are rates are and figure out that it's like not good enough that it as it stands right now and in those cases then I really have to you know that's kind of an immediate turn off so I would definitely like not put that in your deck and really address that more one on one in a, in an actual pitch number 5 is vision you know you want to pitch the biggest vision uh, that you can and I think it's really important when you're pitching and I think it's really important uh, to include a slide that's about here's where we're going you know here's why this is going to change the world and once they're kind of interested and intrigued understanding like where you're going I think is incredibly important and so um, I encourage everyone to put in something about what the world looks like uh, when you are successful and take it over can a vision slide be too ambitious? Vision slide has to be credible. So if you make something that's, you know, says we're going to defeat Google at search, for example, you know, it has to be really credible that you are the team that can do that. You have a product, uh, you know, wedge that you think that can do that. And so I think credibility is super important. Oftentimes, if you make a vision slide that's you know, too aggressive, it, it can kind of take away from that feeling of credibility. Should the vision slide go at the beginning or at the end? A vision slide should definitely go at the end. And why? Uh, because in the beginning, you don't have the um, social currency with me yet that where I believe what you're saying. That's established through you telling me about this problem and then showing me your solution and me believing that it's going to work. And then when you bust out, here's what our vision is, then I'm a lot more inclined to believe that that's possible. So vision slide at, at the back half for sure. All right, those are the five tips, but I still have a few notes to share with you all. Um, one thing is uh, design. So your deck doesn't have to be the prettiest deck, but it can't be so bad looking that it's just like a total turnoff because like looking like some modicum of decent is important to make me think, oh, these people are competent. That's just like what gives, inspires confidence, right? It's like something that doesn't look like it was just done in a sloppy way. Yeah, some decks I liked. Well, Mixed Panel had a really great deck uh, that they used to raise money. Founder Sue Hale published on the internet. I would check that out. There's a pretty good library of decks out there. I'll drop the link below. What did you like about the Mixed Panel deck? I don't remember, to be honest. All right, that was a video. If you found that useful, you know what to do. Like and subscribe, and I will see you guys next time.